It's the Queen City Music Podcast. The podcast devoted to the local music scene in Charlotte, North Carolina. Here's your host, Matthew Ablin. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Queen City Music Podcast. If you have been listening to the QCMP, you'll know I try to speak with people who are involved in the music scene in all sorts of ways. This month is, of course, no different, and I sit down to speak with Jennings Compton, who has been involved with tour merchandising and management for the last several years. All right, Jennings, thank you for coming on the podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. So let's let's jump in, into it. Are you originally from the Charlotte area, or where are you from? No, I'm from uh, upstate South Carolina, a little town called Lawrence. That's for anybody that's familiar with the area. It's about 45 minutes south of Greenville. Is about the best uh, focal point I can give you there. But okay. no, I've been living in Charlotte for about two years now in the okay. Plaza Midwood area. Okay, and what uh, what's your musical background? I. Uh, through high school, I played with a band, uh, some friends of mine, and uh, we were just bad enough to not really take off anywhere. <laughs> so I uh, did that thing. I played bass in that band, and we did some regional tours and stuff like that. But like many of those DIY do-it-yourself bands, you uh, kind of run into some roadblocks financially and some shysty people, and right. you kind of disband from there. How far did you guys tour? Did you tour just regionally, or did uh, you guys go? Out we went as far west as like Minneapolis, and we got up to uh, Rochester, New York, and stuff. Like, uh, kind of behind our parents' backs, honestly. Like, if they knew <laughs> where we actually were, we kind of fudged some numbers as far as where we were. <laughs> they got a little bit different itinerary than what we were actually doing. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, were you guys doing clubs, or were you doing like? Uh, house parties, things like that. House shows. Uh, we used to do shows in Lawrence out of a daycare. Wow. Uh, that was nice enough to let us do some stuff. Uh, we had a couple shows in the middle of the woods on an old housing foundation, a house that had been torn down. Right. And we just ran a generator and uh, cops got called, but they couldn't find us because they didn't know where exactly we were <laughs> and they weren't going to go into the woods <laughs> following the, the guitars. It's kind of like a deliverance thing instead of banjo. <laughs> It was just uh, bad punk four chord music. So, oh man, but uh, no, we've uh, played a little bit of everywhere. Um, for the most part, we were using a website called Indie on the Move because okay. we didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and the drummer of that band would just literally get together and go, "All right, here's every venue in this state. Let's just start calling until somebody says yes. <laughs> Please let us have a gig." Yep. Did you open up for any any uh, you know was it, you were on a bill with other bands or it was just way? mostly we were relying on local bands okay and that sort of thing like we opened up for a couple like sign bands at a point and that shine kind of wore off the apple you know like right. when you're having to sell tickets for like oh you buy these tickets and then whatever money you get back kind of thing and pay to play kind of yeah thing. that was never really our uh, thing yeah that started that thing around. I'm a little older than you, but I remember back in the, the 80s, I remember hearing about that in Los Angeles, and yeah. um, that's where all that kind well, of stuff It's still started. like a prominent thing, and it's a good way for uh, bands to get their feet wet with self-promotion and stuff. Right. But at a point, it's like, all right, Aunt Linda, please take these tickets to work and just sell them to your coworkers, yeah. and nobody's going to come to this uh, thing. And There's a lot of self-pity money coming in for it. <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, somebody can you know, leverage it. Here's here. Uh, my aunt bought it, but she's going to give it to the kids. Yep. And let them go see the band. So that kind of thing. And usually you'll sell all those and there's still only four or five people show up for oh. it. So, uh, and then yeah. eventually your parents are like, we're not buying any more of these. <laughs> we're not spending our money on this. No, no. <laughs> my goodness. So now you've made your way into the world of merchandising. Yep. So how did that happen? What was your transition from, doing the band thing into into getting into merchandising and and two two of the guys that were in the band uh that i played with went on and were in a band called brigades okay uh, they got signed to a record label and they just brought me on board because i had handled most of the business and uh stuff for our band in high school anyway and they're just like you're our friend you kind of know what you're doing Come on. Uh, so we just hop in the van and kind of went. And then we don't want to do it. We need somebody to do it. Exactly. And uh, typically when a band first gets signed on anything, they still don't have any money. So uh, 
is usually just one of the buddies coming along for the ride. Right. And through that, you kind of uh, make your connections and uh, pick up from their odd jobs and things like that okay. and just kind of make a reputation for yourself. And that's what happened with me. You move on from one to another to the next. So what what exactly is involved in the merchandising and the things for for those listening who might be you know interested in not only maybe getting into that themselves, but if they're a band, they need that kind of thing to happen. For well, uh, for most people that don't know, uh, merchandising is going to be the primary source of income for almost every band you right. see. Like compared to like the money they're making from the door, like those CD sales and those merch sales are key for their success. Right. Um, but as far as what my job entails, basically I'm the guy that will order the merch. I'm not necessarily designing or anything. Okay. Uh, I will weigh in from time to time and be like, ah, that design kind of stinks. Or maybe let's put it on a different, maybe that design should be on a hoodie rather than a t-shirt or something like right. that. Like, so my opinion there is, does carry some weight right. with the uh, merch companies or the band themselves. Um, well, if you've been around and you've seen some some things happening, I, say, I know what I've works and what doesn't, and this. then you know sometimes uh, uh, I'm wrong, but most of the time I'm not. It's like I've been around long enough to right. know that, like, oh, that's not going to do well. You know, um, every day I'm setting up, selling to everybody that's at the show that may want something, right. tearing it down, settling out with the venues, um, and settling out would be. Uh, Venues typically will charge a percentage of a band's merch sales. Okay. So um, for a little insider tip here, uh, if you're a merch rep, I'm not giving you real numbers. I'm <laughs> lying to your face uh, because you didn't pay to print any of this. Right. Uh, so I shouldn't have to pay you any money hmm. uh, for being here. So I'm going to look you in the eye and Tell give you, you fake numbers. <laughs> uh, but... uh other than that, like I'm just basically for a lot of people, I am the one contact point. It's okay. probably the hardest part of the job, at least in in my head. Uh, anybody that has a complaint, I'm usually the only point of contact because a lot of times people can't go directly to a band and be mm -hmm. like, "Hey, this stinks about this. I didn't particularly like this." So any complaints or praise usually comes to me. Okay, and. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a customer service that I'm providing. Right. Because there's times where I have to handle people, and then there's times where it's like, hey, man, get out of here. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, I don't want to hear, like, you complaining about the beer prices at the show or something, because that yeah, has nothing, nothing to do with me. <laughs> so, since you're doing the merchandising thing, is it your company? Or are you... Uh, working for someone? How how does that work for you? Uh, my particular situation, I'm just a freelancer. So okay. it's like a big puzzle that I piece together every year, finding right. work. Like pieces will fall in here, pieces will fall out. Like it's a constant changing uh, organism, really. Okay. Um, there are some people that have their own merch companies uh, mm -hmm. that are stay at home merchandisers. Like they'll just handle the orders and the logistics of things. Right. Uh, there's people that work through those merch companies that are like contracted with bands. It's like, okay, well, you order your stuff from us, so this is our representative that we're going to send out on tour with you uh, to make sure we're getting the biggest return. Okay. Uh, that's a bit more formal okay. than what I do. Um, mine is just I've made friendships and positive relationships off of my reputation and worth ethic, work ethic. And, uh, I just built it from there. You know, I've worked for bands and ballet companies and had offers for higher up stuff that just hasn't quite worked right. out. But, you know, that's where I'm at right now and striving to find to a new the niche. Business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when you're doing, how long have you been involved in this during the, the merchandising? And uh, things? Merchandising about four years, touring as a whole with music and just being a part of it about eight years. Okay. So in the last four years you've been doing it, have. The, are there any bands that you've been consistent with doing it or each year is it uh, you're going out with a different band? Uh, a uh, band from Massachusetts called Four Years Strong is my mm -hmm. typical, like I've been with them for about two years. Okay. Uh, those guys are very close friends of mine. Uh, their tour manager and manager is my best friend. Uh, so that's not even like work to me. I go out with them and that's you know just hanging or... out with my friends, having a blast. We go out, we make our money and we come home. 
Hmm. Uh, and then uh, there's other bands that I've just done one-offs with. Right. Um, the Moscow Ballet is another thing that I've worked more than once a couple years in a row. That's a company out of also out of Massachusetts, um, and it's the Nutcracker. Hmm. And it's a touring production. Uh, it's a little bit different set of selling T-shirts and CDs and stuff as ornaments and trinkets and things of that sort, but it's still uh, still the same principle. Okay. And what all right, it's, I guess it depends on where what group you're out on tour with, but what kind of things are you generally selling that, that go the best? So if there's a band listening and they're like, okay, we got to start getting our merch together, what kind of things sell the best out of it out of everything that you see it, it depends on the band and like it's all about your demographic you got to know who you're selling to um right now like anything that's like vaguely resemblance of like anything streetwear like an adidas or a nike's kind of right. thing like that sort of stuff like dad hats like and for, for anybody that wouldn't know a dad hat is just like a hat with like the slide like clasp in the back okay. instead of like the snapback thing yeah those are like a very popular item right now like i've always noticed that shirts with a simpler design do well people don't want a super extravagant like you've got a better bet of just slapping the band's logo on there <laughs> on a black t-shirt than trying to go above and beyond and put right bells and whistles all over something like I i've seen some bands and i'm sure you have where I've looked at the t-shirts and I've been like, oh, I'd love to get the, you know, one of the t-shirts from the show. And then I go to buy it and I'm like, that's just horrendous. I'd never wear yeah. that. Or, and like I said earlier, it's like all about knowing which blank to go with, like playing it safe with color choices or like, I don't know. Like, black is always good. Yeah. Black is always good. <laughs> like, uh, I'm just going to go out and say it, uh, for your strong appeals to like, a military or like a bigger guy like right. muscle bound guy and we steer away from gray shirts because big dudes are sweaters they're gonna sweat <laughs> through that thing so like we always play it safe and try not to do a white or a gray shirt because our demographic is just gonna be like yeah wow, okay i'm not gonna be able to wear that because i'm gonna have pit stains you're gonna you gotta look good in it yeah you gotta look good and and uh so there's certain, I mean, you talk about t-shirts, quality stuff that you steer towards or, and stuff you steer away from saying, you know, it honestly oh, okay, depends we... on how much you're selling. Like, uh, people really steer away from Gildan shirts. Everybody is like very opposed because of the way they shrink or they're, they're is like that a, a brand? Yes. Yeah, okay. A brand of shirt. Um, it is you own a Gildan shirt, 100%. Like, somewhere in your wardrobe, there's a shirt with a Gildan tag on it. It's okay. just a very popular, like, commercial right. t-shirt. Uh, yeah. T-shirt. Um, and it's a cheaper blank. Like, but people are opposed to that, blah, 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 the way they shrink and things. But it's like, know how to wash your clothes, too. That's, like, one of those things that's going back, like, a customer service thing. Right. It's one of the things that's, like, just learn how to wash your clothes. Like, if you're worried about it shrinking, don't blast right. it on high heat. Right. Like, hang you know, dry Don't even put something. it in the dryer. Yeah, hang it. You want the color to last? Don't put it in the dryer. Yeah, so, so it's, like, one thing is, like, maybe I feel like a jerk saying it, but it's, like, just know what you're buying. Like, I'll, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. But just don't complain about what we're printing on. Just buy it. <laughs> You know, we're just trying to sell some merch, man. Yeah, I mean, at the end it's of the day, it's a rock concert shirt. I mean, are you going to wear it to work every day? Well, I mean, if you're as punk rock as you think you are for being at these shows, like you're really, <laughs> you're really gonna like tighten up over. No, oh, no, that's a Gildan T-shirt. I can't go home with that. <laughs> you know, maybe next time, man. You know, you just want to tear the sleeves off and be more punk yeah, rock. That's it's basically not about what that. it is. It's like. You're probably going <laughs> to drop it in the mosh pit or something. Like, I get that all the time, too. People buy something at the beginning of the show. Right. Oh, can you hold it? No, I can't hold anything back here. I'm sorry. They'll go off, watch the show, and they lose come it. back. Hey, man, like, I was stage diving. I lost the shirt. Can I get a new one? Yeah, you can buy a new one, but I'm not going <laughs> to give you a new shirt. You always get the shirt after the yeah, show, I mean, not before the show. Oh, uh, The craziest it. one to me is kids that will come up and buy vinyl records. Before uh, a show, and then uh, just like be like, all right, and then they'll just walk around with them. Uh, 
and Bad choice. Yeah. So after, after. Yeah. yeah. That's what we wait on that long extended line and and do that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, we we know what we're selling. We like you got to trust us that we're going to have stuff at the end. A lot right. of people get worried that oh, you're going to sell out. It's like. No, we do this all year. Like we, we know how much we're projected to do. Just trust us that there's going to be stuff here. Like we'll be up after the show. Just come back at the end. So we, when you're out on a tour with a band, how long are you generally gone for on these tours? It depends. This next tour I'm doing is two weeks and that's a short one. Wow. Uh, but typically a full U S tour is going to be anywhere from five to seven weeks. Okay. Uh, just to try to hit every market. Everyone's a little bit different because a lot of times they'll throw a couple Canadian dates in there. Uh, they're just trying to hit everything. Like it depends on the band and that sort of thing too. Like they'll throw their hot markets in there. And then there's some bands that will only tour once a year. Right. That's like, all right, we're doing the one tour. It's going to be eight weeks. Mm -hmm. We're hitting all the markets this one time. Come or don't. Hmm. So... So it just depends where you get stuck with the ballet thing. We're out for two straight months. So when you do it, when you schedule yourself, are you scheduling as well as much as you can in advance and saying, okay, in advance, I know I'm going to yep. do this and for then this I've, time, period of time and have a week off in between. And then I'm going to pick up this show and then, and yep. And then I've shows. also had tours that have started the day after one ended. Wow. Uh, I've left tours and gone into another tour. Mm -hmm. Just found coverage for the last few days. Uh, I think the craziest one, uh, I was in Puerto Rico on vacation with uh, a couple buddies of mine. And I get a call. Hey, man, I can't do this tour. It starts in two days. Uh, can you do it? Well, where does it start? And what's all the details and everything? It starts in Montreal. So I fly from Tropical Paradise, Puerto Rico, <laughs> to, to pack, a bag, pack, a ba pack a bag in Charlotte, and then fly to Montreal where it was freezing. Yes. And then just went right into a tour, you know. Wow. And so you last few years you've been doing this. I, you don't have to name names, but has there been a tour that you, you went on with a group or a, a, a company or something like that, and you've been like, I will never go. Go with oh, these yeah. folks. Again. I'll name names. I don't care. <laughs> uh, a band called Tiny Moving Parts. I didn't know the guys. I got the offer to do the tour. Right. Um, I went out and our styles just didn't mesh. Uh, I don't drink or anything. And I'm not knocking anybody that does, but uh, they're heavy drinking band and they were just hard to work for. Wow. And uh, I've been very open about that. And I mean, Maybe like, I don't care, honestly, like yeah. <laughs> it's not hindering any work that I'm getting right. and they know that I didn't have the best of time and we kind of left it at that. I'm not speaking poorly of the guys at all, but it just, it just a bad wasn't experience. bad experience. So way it goes sometimes. Are, are you for, are, are you forthcoming when you, before you take a gig heading out with somebody and say, look, this is kind of the way I operate. I just want to make sure we, we gel uh, not in particular, like I brought up like the not drinking and them drinking. Thing. I don't ever present that as like a, right. Well, you're on, uh, if you're out uh, with a Brock band. Yeah, yeah. I don't like ever. Cause that's just pointless. Cause right. there's going to be a mix of people at all times. I, I do tell people like, especially when I'm tour managing, cause I do dabble in that as well. Okay. Like this is how I would like things to run. Please tell me how you want things run and let's kind of meet in the middle. Uh, just because I've done tours as well where the tour manager goes out and is just like this, 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 and this, and it's just ruined everyone's time. It's just felt too right. rigid. Uh, r yeah. So I like to just go with the flow. Like, it's supposed to be fun. Touring's the best thing in the world. And when someone comes in and just makes it too detail-oriented, it gets to be kind of a drag. Hmm. So you're, you, when did you start doing the tour management? Uh, I've just done one or two uh, brigades. I was their acting tour manager. Okay. Uh, that was a very low maintenance thing because they never got beyond like being an opener or a two hole on a tour. So it was very low maintenance. It was just go and pick up the check and make sure we're at the venue at all time right. on time and then check into the hotel kind of thing. Is, is that um, something you want to get into more? The tour uh, yeah, I'm actually doing a tour here in a few weeks with a band called Movements from California. Okay. Um, 
it's their first headliner and I'm going to be tour managing the entire tour for that. So how, how do you wind up hooking up with these guys? Do you know the folks at their, well, I don't want to say record company, but maybe, uh, uh, it's through their they're... management company. And funny enough, uh, it was the same management company, uh, as tiny moving parts. And <laughs> even though I didn't necessarily get along with tiny moving parts manager, uh, movements manager, like the way I ran things with them. Right. And she was like, yeah, uh, I'm not going to necessarily say what she said about tiny moving parts, but she was like, they were just tough to work. Regardless with. of how it went with them. I like the way you handled that yeah. tour. So I would like to bring you back out with one of my bands. So, uh, it just kind of happens like that. You meet random people you go through and, I've actually gotten more jobs through just becoming friends with bands than management companies or record labels and things like that. So, yeah, but you'll, I think over time you'll, you develop more of a reputation where somebody says, Hey, we went out with Jennings and we had a great experience with him. And you know, we wanted yep. to have other groups go out with them and, and that's and uh, ideally the goal. So what exactly is your job description when you're doing tour management i mean it might be different uh, from different situations but well i'll, I'll just give you the rundown for the movements one since this one's fresh on my mind and i'm still actively working as a tour manager for that tour but right now i'm in the tour advancing stage okay where basically i'm reaching out to all the promoters and the talent buyers hey uh let me get some information back about the show let's make a schedule for the day as far as load in and sound checks and this is what we have on the rider how do we want to balance this budget out what can you provide what can't you provide uh what's the wi-fi because that's the big question for everybody now as soon as you get there oh, i gotta have the wi-fi info right um what's the parking situation uh we'll show up to the venue as once we get out on the tour, I'll get everybody load in. We'll do a venue walkthrough, the intros with everybody. Just make sure my guys are all settled in. Right. I'm also doing merch on that tour, so kind of uh, comboing that one. So I'll mm -hmm. probably, by that time, be setting up uh, my normal routine for merchandising, uh, getting counted in and just a nice display and be ready to go for the show. And then throughout the show, I'll just keep an eye, make sure everything's running smoothly. If there's any issues... Just kind of squash those as they go. Maybe it's a drunk guy <laughs> acting a fool and we got to get him out of there. Right. Maybe the sound, there's an issue. I need to relay messages between the bands and the sound guy. Okay. Hey, the levels are off or whatever. Uh, and just make sure everybody's happy on the tour. Make sure everybody's safe on the tour and make sure bands, the promoter and the fans and management are all as happy as they can be. Are you handling all the travel arrangements and things like that? Or is that done beforehand? Uh, I will be booking like the hotels and things of that sort. Okay. They kind of handle like the management will handle flights and things of that sort. But uh, lucky enough with it being movements headliner, it starts in California. Right. So we don't have to worry about any flights other than my own. Okay. So my flight will be bought fly out and we'll just go from there. So you're trying to, are you trying to get them? Um start working for a specific management company uh, or, you know, get picked up by a management company so that you have steady work as a tour manager, or is that something it, that it's kind of hard to get in like that? It's kind of hard to get in like that just because they're, they don't want to like contract anybody really. Right. So it's easier for people to just do one offs and keep freelancing. Okay. Um, if I were to ever get into that, like contracted work, mm -hmm. I would like to do it in sports world, honestly, like just be a sports manager for like a baseball team or a hockey team or something like that, just because that's a bit more, uh, rigid schedule where, mm -hmm. um, I can know how long I'm going to be contracted through rather than signing on with a band. It's like, who knows the longevity of this band's career right. and, uh, you can kind of just go season by season with the sports as far as contracted work. Okay. So as of right now, I'm happy being freelancing. Like okay. it's kind of going out there on a tightrope without a safety net, but I love it. Hmm. And um, how long do you have things lined up for for this coming year? Because we're at the start of the year. So how since you are an independent contractor basically how long do you have things lined up for 2018 for yourself uh, as of right now through the end of the summer i'm locked down okay uh and then i have like soft offers for the fall and winter but that's just through my own personal preference i don't like to lock down more than 
a few months ahead of time, just because you never know what's going to happen. Right. What what could come up? Yeah. So like, I hate locking in with people and then just having to, Hey man, something came up. I would rather not. So typically I'd feel comfortable locking stuff down uh, about three or four months in advance. Okay. So you've been out for a few years. What, <laughs> what's the craziest things that's the kind of thing that's happened to you while you've been out with a, with a group or while you're on tour? Um, we get asked this question a lot and it's always hard cause like every night's a little bit different. Right. Um, Chicago, a couple of times we've had, uh, the vehicle we were traveling, like graffiti tagged. Yeah. Uh, and it was from a rental company. So we would have to like find <laughs> a place to like get turpentine yeah. and like scrub that off. Oh. Um, cause they want their money. I've had, uh, verbal run-ins with like the merchandise reps and stuff. Like I told you, like arguments over money. Like I'm not going to back down and just hand you an absorbent amount of money right, right. just because, you know, so there's guys that will like get a little lippy with that and I'll tell them what I think. Um, and I'd like to think that the bands appreciate that I'm not just going to give in and just be like, here's money you didn't really earn, but thanks kind of thing. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of like the craziest one. Uh, I thought we were going to have a plane crash one time in Europe. That was kind of <laughs> crazy. Uh, we were flying back from, no, we were flying back from Ireland to England and we had been delayed for four or five hours because of like high winds and we get in the air. Like finally they're like, okay, we're just going. We're and just are gonna you chance in, it. like 747 or are you in a small plane? Where no, you... it was, it was a big plane, but still it, the fear of flying, like anybody that's like, oh, flying's fine. It's like, no, you're in a tin can <laughs> tens of thousands of feet. Like that, like if you hit some turbulence, you're going to jump up like yeah, right. a little bit at least. I, I'm not a fan. Um, <laughs> and this was the first time we ever actually had like, all right, everybody, this is like a serious thing. Everybody right. stay in your seat. Nobody. And we went down like twice and the wind was blowing us out of line with the runway. Oh. So we were having to go all the way back up, come back, down. come back down. And we did that two or three times. And to me, that was probably the craziest one. But as far as like somebody wanting to hear like, oh, you guys tore apart a hotel room. That's never happened. Because <laughs> they got to pay for it. Yeah, no. <laughs> this is not the 1960s and 70s no. anymore. Man. You can't just put down a cash deposit anymore. It's Credit somebody's card. card is going to get maxed out. They're going to get charged. Yeah. Yeah. No television's so, going out. So, yeah, so the there was pool. nothing insane. Um, the craziest thing I saw, though, like uh, I saw a few years ago on Warp Tour a bandwagon driver, and bandwagons just a similar alternative to a bus. Okay. Uh, we were going on to long Island and one of the bandwagons clipped an overpass. Right. And just ripped the entire top of the bandwagon off. Wow. And we found out somebody was in the top bunk. They were fine, but it was just like, if the person had been sleeping on their side, they would have been done for. Oh, so man. that was one of the crazier things I saw. Jeez. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. So you're, you're not going out with like top level bands that are staying in fancy hotels. So what, what's the travel like? Is it, is it, you know, packing into a van? I mean, I can't uh, imagine everybody's got a big fancy tour bus to head out on. Uh, some bands will be in the bandwagon, that alternative. Um, it's just a little bit cheaper and you don't have to have a driver with a CDL right. uh, to drive those. So that's like a cheaper alternative. So you still get the luxury of like, oh, you have a bunk and there's a little kitchen space and a bathroom kind of thing. Um, but I still do tours in 15 passenger vans with trailers. Um, I've done bus tours. I've done fly in shows. But for the most part, we're just in a bandwagon. As far as right now, but like I'm not above just getting in a van and going. Right. To me, I prefer doing that just because it builds more camaraderie. Like if you get an argument with somebody in a bus or a bandwagon, you can just go hide away and pout in your bunk. <laughs> but a van, you still got to look yeah. whoever in the face all day long. Yeah, it doesn't sound like fun. Yeah. And then you just get at the gas station, you buy them a Coke and they're fine. <laughs> well, I mean, you read these, these things, you know, for these rock stars and it all sounds so glamorous, but... 
I don't know. It doesn't these days. It doesn't sound as glamorous if, unless you've got millions of dollars. No, I've still pee in a bottle at least once <laughs> every tour on a drive. So I don't think Nikki Six was having to do that or anything. You know, I think he probably did in their early he, days. Maybe, maybe not currently. I think yeah, he's no, probably he, like um, no, I'm hopping on a plane. Yep. <laughs> So what else? What what else are you involved in in town, man? You're uh, doing the music I, tour, and you're doing the uh, you're doing the management. You're doing merchandising. What else? Yeah, I do a little comedy here from there. A little stand up comedy, uh, performing and writing. Uh, it's a new thing. Uh, I've been able to find kind of a stronghold in the music world okay. with it. Uh, when I started doing it, I just couldn't bring myself to start from grassroots with it. Right. Uh, I've caught flack for that. Oh, you're cheating, blah, blah, blah. If I have a spot in it, like, I'm just going to take it, you know? So I've gotten to open for some of the bands I work for. They're nice enough to give me five or ten minutes before they're set to okay. get up there and do that. And that's just not the normal track for a lot of people. Most people do an open mic scene, right? Uh, get a set ready, start doing little feature spots, and then go from there. But mine, I've been able to kind of skip the scrutiny of let me go to this bar and talk to three or four people that were here for trivia night that are just staying over <laughs> and they hate it. Uh, so I've found a crowd with like the music scene that uh, I've been able to tell some stories and do some music related humor and stuff that just works better for me. Okay. What's um so how can folks find out about you and everything that you're doing? Do you have a website, a company website that, that to get get to? No, if you want to get in touch with me, it's social media. Okay. Like Jennings Compton Comedy on Instagram, at Kid Compton on Twitter. Okay. I'll put some stuff in the show. Don't notes add me on Facebook. Like, <laughs> if I don't uh, know you, I don't want to be friends with th you. That, like, I don't know. I, I try to keep personal life as kind of separate from all this because right. there will be some people that overstep bound like even though i'm just a merch guy or whatever behind the scenes there's always the three or four freak people that are like oh you know this guy from this band let's be friends too nope uh, don't want to know you sorry <laughs> well that sounds good man so when do you head out again on on tour uh february 10th uh, meet up with the four year guys. We're headed down to Jacksonville. I still don't know where I'm meeting up with them. I think uh, I have to drive to Fayetteville. Okay. Uh, somewhere because they're going to be coming down 95 and we're just going to hop in. Are they doing any Charlotte dates? We're doing Charlotte at the underground. Second day of the tour. What, what do you have the, you know the uh, date offhand? Let me give you a date real quick. Yeah. Sorry. Listeners got to flip through the old phone ski. <laughs> Well, we'll be uh, uh, be February at 13th at the Underground. February Less 13th. than Jake, Four Year Strong, Direct Hit, and Bearings. Oh, man. So, I hope I get this podcast up before then for you. Yeah. So yeah. if not, uh, the show was great from the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jennings, man, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate you coming out on the podcast. No problem. And, thanks um, for having me. Hopefully we'll have you back again in the future. Maybe when you come back from tour towards the end of the year, you can fill us in on, on some things that have been yeah, happening Absolutely. For I'd love to come back and stir the pot a little more. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Have a great day. All right. Thanks a lot. And that'll bring episode six of the Queen City Music Podcast to a close. We're on iTunes, so if you would be kind enough to stop by there and leave us a review, I'd greatly appreciate it. Until next episode, enjoy. Enjoy.